so I'm talking today to Jason Lee, um, England NGB coach. Uh, Jason's been there quite a while now, uh, one of the top coaches in the world. And so Jason, um, let me just ask you, what are the critical factors in creating a winning hockey team? Uh, well, I think um, most team sports, it goes beyond the activities of the team themselves. Yeah. I think if you look in world hockey, for example, the, the countries that have been consistent over a long time, you look for reasons why and you see consistency in how their juniors do or how their club setup is. Um, it's very difficult to kind of break the, the, the parameters of your system just with a team. I think GB and England hockey have done a pretty decent job in the last cycle to kind of break the standards of for particularly how our juniors have been doing um, and that's been really with looking at the odds and playing playing a really good odds you know playing our game and uh, trying to make the most of what we've got in our strengths and uh, missing our weaknesses but same with any high performing group um, it takes a bit of strategy a vision for what you want to achieve lots of work and uh, continually anal analyzing what uh, what you're doing and how you're trying to achieve mm. uh, in the modern game how important is it to have a specialist drag flicker uh, well, I mean, I think uh, we lost 9-2 in, in the Olympic semi-final to, to Holland, and although they had some really yeah. sort of good spells in that game, the thing that created the, the uh, impetus for them was that they scored four out of five corners. It wasn't the same person that scored, yeah. but uh, it is one of the specialist skills that still remains in, in hockey that can really make the difference, as you know, Takamar did for Holland for a long time as well. Uh, I know the GB women are very thankful that they have Krista Cullen in yeah. their team, for, particularly for drag flicks. So, personally, I don't like the safety aspect of uh, penalty corners, yep. so I'd like a different version, but it certainly is a game changer still. Mm, yeah. Um, selecting players, a lot of players choose themselves, or some of the players choose themselves to a degree anyway, and then it comes right down to the bottom end, or uh, the choice comes eventually to two players. How do you select? from out of those two what makes a difference of one player over another uh, what do you mean so let, let's say you've got the squad of 18 you've got 17 you've decided on now you've got one more to select and you've probably got uh, five six seven people you could potentially select to fill that one spot how do you make that final decision well interestingly I don't think it often comes down to one slot um, for <coughs> our last Olympic selection yep. we have players that play in combination yep okay um, and also, it depends on what your aspirations are. Um, so we certainly had a we had an aspiration for the Olympics was to try and win it, although it was clearly a stretch goal for us. That's good. Uh, and we selected mm. with trying to be successful towards the end of the tournament, as opposed to just um, being balanced throughout it. And that creates different selection um, outcomes. But also, it's often not one player against another. It's actually how does he play with them, and actually do we have skills that complement each other across the group. Uh, we are very analytical in our approach, so we have lots of numbers to support um, our selection, although it, it does often come down to just the artistry of, um, mm. of coaching where, you know, what you predict might happen. And, uh, but there's lots of risk and uh, advantage in selection. I'd say for our selection, we didn't have anything that was really that close. Um, or that they were no. close in their performance standards, but we had enough to support both subjectively and objectively that supported the decisions we made given the um, you know the objective mm. we were trying to achieve. But it's a, it's an it's an in-depth process, yeah. mm. certainly is. Um, but in many respects, I think selection is more about the machinery of players and hockey teams, not the emotions of it. And the more you get emotions involved in those decision makings, the more that you can make inappropriate decisions. Okay, you talk about emotions and selection of players. Um, that comes down to something I know you've um, talked about in the past, which is the motivation of players. How do you motivate your players? Now you've got your squad, how are you going to motivate them? Well, um, it depends how, again, it depends on lots of context. On the assumption that you're trying to be ambitious in what you're trying to achieve at a tournament and you have enough time with the players, it's the saying that it's what the fire that burns within them as opposed to burns underneath them. <laughs> um, and I think often if you're with people a long time but also that what you're trying to achieve is a stretch for them, mm. if you don't start to have uh, motivational forces that are personal to them, um, then you start to have problems. Mm. Um, but then the challenge is also to make sure that there's shared objectives and shared values of the group and the individual motivations and 
values and beliefs actually can integrate into that. It becomes quite a complex story mm. and one that we gave a lot of time to. Um, I still think we had some outliers that didn't fully sit in within the kind of the shared beliefs and objectives mm. of the team and their personal motivations didn't, uh, you know, mm. equal, easily uh, yeah. combine with it. But it's there's no one there's no one trick. It's, no. A, it's a long in, in, uh, in involved process to try and ensure that everybody is motivated for things that are really personal for them, but also for the team as well. Okay, you've motivated your team, you've selected them, you've motivated them. Something's not going right. How do you criticise them? Uh, well, most of uh, there's, there's 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 two processes of that, or three even. And one is how you give it, but the actually it also is how it's received. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the relationship, which is the third part. Mm. And uh, they're not. It's not that you. There's I, there's nothing that we would be doing in the Olympics that we hadn't tried to build the, the, the kind of the structures around it. So actually. Yes, looking deep into how I could communicate so that it doesn't come across as criticism, it comes back as feedback. Of course. But also the way that the athletes are kind of educated and experienced, um, actually so that feedback is feedback and not uh, criticism. And then actually building on the relationship between the, those giving the, the feedback, whether it's peers, player to player or coach to player mm. or player to coach. And those relationships need working on and, and um, delving into to ensure that there's common understanding. Uh, occasionally, the harsh word is required, but I think that's like the last yeah. commandment. Yeah, it's not really something you want to delve into no. very often. And I think if we're using terms like criticism, we know we're at, at the point where we've either made a failure in our organisation to start off with over the years in advance, or we're in a critical moment. Um, yeah. And you know, we certainly had critical moments at the Olympics where I'm sure it felt like criticism. Yes, yeah. Well, the pressure's on, so sometimes it perhaps comes out a bit that way when things are getting um, down to the wire. Um, we see these days, we used to have the old style of player, which was a full-back, a half-back, and maybe a, a forward. A specialist, oftentimes, even in an individual position. We don't seem to see so much of that these days. How do you develop the all-round player? Well, that's beyond, I personally think that's beyond the international team's um, uh, remit. Yep. Yes. Uh, it's largely what's developed by the system. It's again why I think you can see successful countries, yeah. they actually are system orientated. Um, <coughs> so if you just have a fullback playing fullback, then they just tend to have, they exemplify the, the specific skills of fullback. But actually, when you get to international hockey, yeah. um, it's, it's very, a successful player. It should ideally be able to play equally in any position. Well, they still have a little bit of a tendency for one skill above another, or more experience means in one area, so they can read the game better. But it's, it's a system process. Yeah. Um, you know that we don't pigeonhole people just to be in one position as they're developing, so they get a broader experience. Um, it's interesting in in the UK that we have less hockey players that were previously footballers. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I certainly think we're starting to see that they have a, a, a less advanced game understanding as they come into international mm. hockey. Interestingly, though, they tend to be more tennis player or cricket player, hockey yeah. players. Yes. And uh, some of their core passing skills are improved clearly as a consequence of, of that as they experience. But in terms of a system, we want to give them a broad education so it's not mm. position specific. OK, we talked before about um, short corners. During the game, we constantly see the attacking short corners reviewed. The word comes out from the bench for every top international team. We see this. Do you review the defending short corner live during the course of the game and send out instructions as to any changes that should be made? Uh, the penalty corner defence is reactionary. Yep. So we can't really do much to, to call that during yep. a game uh, unless we see a consistent pattern that organised countries mm. at the level yeah. we are, we've been playing at I assume like we do, you work hard to make sure there isn't a consistency of pattern that can be read. Um, but we do review penalty corner defence as much as we review penalty corner attack. It's just that we can't impact on a game in penalty corner defence the same as we can um, on, with penalty corner attack. OK. When a player receives the ball, what's the first thing they should do? <laughs> Go and score a goal. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, Might not necessarily be a forward, could be a defender, could be a halfback or somebody in an inside channel. 
Yeah, so, well, it, it, it's so complicated. I'm sure yeah. you understand that. I mean, part you know, we build it down from the, the, the basics. So we're trying to win the game. We always yes. try to win the game. I, I, I think sub, subconsciously, some countries actually don't have that as their ultimate outcome. Okay. Um, because you can see how their tactics are. That it's sure. slightly uh, different than that. But we certainly have. As long as, as, long as I've been involved, it's yeah. we have a winning mentality. And that does drive everything, every mm. single action. Uh, it's why we sometimes get horrible beatings, but it's also how we sometimes come back from games. It is partly why we struggle sometimes when the result's slightly unusual through the course of a game. But, um, you know, we're led by that. We try and win games, and that mostly means scoring goals with a second emphasis of not conceding. Yeah. And then things <laughs> lead from there. OK, so just following on from there then, an attacker receives the ball, so is it up in the forward quarter of the field. Do you have any rules about when he should take on the defence or when he should lay the ball off? We have lots of um, small unit play rules um, yeah. and we try and ensure that everybody has a common understanding so that on every instant they have two or three options. They know where the pass option is going to be offered, they know where the dribble option is and they know where the, sp the path space is going yeah. to be created. Yeah. Um, and we do lots of drills to ensure that that gets repeated and so that they have a subconscious understanding of what's going to be happening. Mm. Final question. We've seen another change in the rules of hockey this year. We're at Melbourne 2012 now. Uh, we've seen many changes in the rules of hockey over the years. If you could change one rule in the game, what would it be and why? Oh, so many, so many <laughs> rules. I think we're blighted in our game at the moment by an inconsistency of approach. Mm. So there's lots of rules that on their own I think have, me have merit, but they tend to be contradictory to other rules and other in inter in interventions we've had in the game. Um, I mean, overridingly, I'd like us to have a statement of what we're trying to actually achieve by through mm. for our game so that everything can mm. have a, you yeah. know, follow along a, along a consistent strategy mm. and vision for the game. But if you're asking of a specific rule, it seems unusual that we can't play the uh, the ball above our shoulder anymore. We can when there's a shot on goal. Uh, I, I can't see many benefits for that. Um, I'd like to change how we have the penalty, the circle free hit played into the circle because I certainly think that undermines the attacking play of a lot of teams. So how would you change that? Well I thought when they said you couldn't pass into the circle I thought that could be an easy um, change just having the umpires have an interpretation that basically yeah. started to establish that you don't play it in with any pace or aggression yeah. um, and a lot of our rules in our, our sport actually are interpretations and you won't find them written yeah. down they just become a yeah. common understanding and I, I felt that like we could have established that just by umpire interpretation creating a common understanding mm. Jason Lee, good luck with the rest of the Champions Trophy and thank you very much for your time Thank you